I'm so glad to meet you, even if we're in this cave of Plato of Zoom. I, we've been trying to meet now for two years because Alexander and I were working last year through the Russian embassy in Italy, trying to get a visa. And as it turns out now, at least we can meet through the cyber waves. Thank you for the kind words about my book. It was so enjoyable to write it. My co-author, Noah Charney, is a generation younger than I am, and he's one of the most cheerful people that I've ever met. And so it meant working with him was a sheer delight. We never had an argument. It's just not in his nature to argue about anything. And we're now starting a new book on one of the streets of Rome. We were so grateful also to get to know Giorgio Vasari in a very different way. Because like you, I knew him from these big books. He seemed terribly important. And his paintings, which I admit I didn't love, but getting to know him better has also meant appreciating his paintings much more than I used to. So let's see if we can launch the PowerPoint. So I think this should be it. So here, he was born in Arezzo, which is a Tuscan city south of Florence. And then he died in Florence when he was 62. He just missed his 63rd birthday. And he was hard at work painting the dome of Florence Cathedral a death that he probably would have appreciated greatly because his idol Michelangelo died at work on the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And here he is in a self-portrait later in life when he's got that wonderful gold chain. And you can see him posing with a paintbrush in his hand. He's got grain hair. There's not as much of it as he probably would like. And then underneath his hand is something very important I want to talk about. And I hear that in Russian, you have the same problem that we have in English, that his word, disegno, means so many different things. And there is no single word in English that can say disegno and mean all the things that Giorgio Vasari meant by it. Basically, it means design, but it means the mental process of a design. So still in English, we have the idea of a designing woman who's supposed, a woman who has ulterior motives and an ulterior plan. It means drawing in the sense of taking a pencil or charcoal or some drawing instrument. And what you see under Vasari's hand here is disegno in that sense. But it also, in Tuscan art, specifically meant the way that people learned how to practice art in the first place. In Venice, you learned painting. And mixing colors was important. In Tuscany, you learned disegno first. So you drew before you ever learned to paint or to sculpt. And architecture, for the most part, was a job that artists trained in other fields came to when they were adults, and often very mature adults. So Filippo Brunelleschi was trained as a goldsmith. Vasari was basically trained as a painter. Michelangelo was trained as a sculptor. And from these roots, in Tuscany, there was something behind everything. All of these men learn to draw before they learn to do anything else. And when they thought about the way they made art, they thought about disegno first, the patterns, the design, the order that created a work of art. There's a note of Michelangelo's on a drawing of one of his students, and it says, disegno Antonio, disegno Antonio, disegno, draw Antonio, draw Antonio, draw Antonio, and never be satisfied. The name Vasari means potter, and the Vasari family 
were potters from Arezzo, which was a pottery center. And here you're seeing the side of Piazza Grande, the central piazza of Arezzo during their summer festivals. And you can see it was a beautiful medieval town that sat on top of a beautiful Roman town that sat on top of a beautiful Etruscan town. It's a significant city. It was especially important in making pottery. So the pottery from Arezzo, the famous terra sigillata, was, import, or was exported all over the ancient Roman world. And Giorgio Vasari Sr., our Giorgio's grandfather, was himself a potter. His father had been a painter. Giorgio's own father had moved up in the world. He was a cloth merchant. And because he was a cloth merchant, he'd gotten out of the artisan class, and he wanted his son to have a gentleman's education. So he wouldn't start out as an apprentice, but rather be educated in Latin and in Tuscan vernacular, which was thought certainly by Tuscans and by many people in 16th century Italy to be the most elegant and certainly the most historically significant dialect of Italian vernacular, because that was the language of Dante, the language of Boccaccio, and the language of Petrarch, even though Petrarch was born in exile in Avignon. But Petrarch himself came from Arezzo. And it means that if you were from Arezzo, you had a certain pride in being there. Florentines look down on people from Arezzo, but people from Arezzo still feel very strongly that they have something very special and it goes back to a long history. When Vasari was eight years old, he had a visit from his distant uncle, Luca Signorelli of Cortona, whom we know best from these incredible frescoes in the cathedral at Orvieto. The one I'm showing you here is painted in 1504. So it's painted seven years before Giorgio was actually born. And you can see Luca Signorelli here in the corner looking at his handiwork. And what you're seeing here is the end of the world. This is Antichrist with the devil behind him preaching to the crowds. These are important families from Orvieto. This is one of the local hotheads, a young man named Andrea Monaldeschi. And over here is the important Jewish banker. Moise de Blanis, and so this has an anti-Semitic charge, as well as showing Antichrist, and Antichrist is asking for contributions. Oops, I want to go the other way. So here people are giving money to Antichrist, but in the end, the Archangel Michael blasts him out of the heavens, and you can see war, all sorts of terrible things are happening. And so that's how I've always thought about Luca Signorelli. But to Vasari, he made a very different impression. So the eight-year-old Giorgio met him when he was 80 years old. He was probably no longer blonde, but gray-haired. And Vasari writes, I remember that good old man, when impeccably graceful, learned from my tutor that I did nothing in school but make little drawings. He turned to my father, Antonio, and said, Antonio, if you want to keep Giorgino in line, by all means, have him learn disegno. Because even if he becomes a scholar, disegno, as for every gentleman, can only bring him utility, honor, and benefit. Then, turning to me as I stood right in front of him, he said, learn, little nephew, impara parentino. He said a number of other things about me that I will not reveal because I know how little I have lived up to the opinion that good old man had of me. Signorelli at the time also gave little Giorgio Vasari a jasper stone because already at the age of eight, Vasari had precarious health. He was prone to nosebleeds and nosebleeds often are a sign of stress. And I have this feeling that somehow the child was already 
extremely high strung as the man would be in later life. But he's also filled with the energy of two people. Giorgio was very little. He was a short, super energetic kind of man. And once he's eight years old, he's been given license through Luca Signorelli both to study Latin and to study drawing. Every well brought up gentleman learned disegno, but Giorgio Vasari's father knew his son well enough to realize that Giorgio had the energy of two people. And so he was studying as a scholar, but at the same time, he apprenticed with the maker of this stained glass window, Guillaume de Marcia, who was a Frenchman who came down to Italy to make stained glass windows, including in Arezzo, and then settled in Arezzo, so that Giorgio Vasari, for three years, was both taking private lessons in Latin and vernacular literature, but he was also working as an apprentice, mixing colors for Marcia, and above all, learning design, learning how to draw in a professional way. Giorgio was so good at Latin that when a passing cardinal came through, they put him as an 11-year-old boy in front of the cardinal to make a performance and recite in Latin. And the cardinal said, you're really intelligent. Why don't you come with me? I'm the tutor to the two Medici boys, Ippolito and Alessandro, who are just your age. And it would be nice to have a studious boy like you who would inspire them to work harder. These are clearly portraits of the two of them done later when they were little boys. Certainly, Ippolito didn't have that beard. This is a painting done in his last year of life by Titian when he'd been sent off to negotiate with the Turks and came back in a Turkish outfit in Cardinal Scarlet. As you can see, Titian was taken both by the handsomeness of Ippolito and by the costume. The portrait that we see on the other side is Alessandro, whose mother was a Moorish slave. And so Alessandro was mixed race, showing that, in fact, there were a lot of Africans already in Italy at the time. And he's become very important recently because he's a good example of the fact that racism as we know it in the U.S. did not exist yet. It was product of other circumstances. Ippolito was highly intelligent and would have been an excellent ruler. Alessandro was on the lazy side. It was just their personalities. But Giorgio Vasari was certainly not well born enough to live in Palazzo Medici with them. Instead, he lived on the Ponte Vecchio right here at the end of the bridge. And this is the facade of the pharmacy that you now see from what used to be the lodging house for the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta, had a headquarters. Actually, they weren't the Knights of Malta yet. They were the Knights of almost going to leave Rhodes. So they were the Knights who were about to leave their lose their foothold in Rhodes. We're not sure where they were going to go, but they ended up in Italy when they were thrown out of Rhodes in 1522. So this is where you can still see next to the jewelry shops of the Ponte Vecchio where Giorgio lived. So he lived there on the other side of the Arno from Palazzo Medici, crossed the entire city to have lessons with Ippolito and Alessandro at Palazzo Medici. And then he spent the rest of his time doing disegno and visiting all the artists' studios. He especially worked with the great painter Andrea del Sarto, whom he blames, again, of, as somebody lazy. It's frequent that you'll see in Vasari's lives that he'll say that some great painter is lazy because he himself was never lazy. He would finish a job on time, even if it was a great expense to his health, if he didn't sleep. With Baccio Bandinelli, there's an interesting situation which Giorgio Vasari, to a certain extent, shares. Bandinelli was one of the greatest 
draftsmen of his own time. His disegni were absolutely beautiful. His sculptures never quite lived up to the promise of his disegni. And here in this portrait of him, you see him holding one of his drawings, promising that it's going to look as beautiful as a Michelangelo, and then it never quite worked out. But as a drawing teacher, you could not have done better than Bandinella. As a painting teacher, Andrea del Sarto, after Raphael, was one of the great colorists. And so Giorgio, for about five years, had a wonderful time in Florence, meeting absolutely everybody, spending time in Palazzo Medici with the young men who were expected to succeed to running Florence eventually. And that, for somebody who's interested in art, is fundamental because it meant he would get commissions from his old friends in the future. All of this ended when Georgia was 16. His father suddenly died and he had to go back to Arezzo. So this is City Hall in Arezzo. It meant that he had to take care of his family's affairs. He was the eldest child. And so at the age of 16, he started working as a professional artist trying to secure the family's fortunes, making sure that his sisters married good husbands, making sure that his mother had a steady income. And so it was the first time he'd had a wonderful chance when he met the Cardinal. He'd had a wonderful chance when he met Luca Signorelli. And this was his first lesson that life can hand tragedy to you as much as good fortune. It left a lasting impression on him because these years of having to work all the time simply to restore his family fortunes made him a dedicated worker as really almost no other artist. Except, let's see, Titian worked extremely hard, Raphael worked extremely hard, Michelangelo did, but Vasari was famous for getting his work finished exactly when he promised. And that's a legacy of being a teenage boy. He wasn't even legally responsible yet. That happened in Italy when you were 21. So this is a teenage boy who suddenly has to become the master of his family. He was successful enough that he stabilized everything fairly quickly. And one of the few solaces of this time is that he met Rosso Fiorentino, a Florentine painter who'd been down in Rome and in 1527, the year that Vasari's father died, Rome was sacked by mercenaries, most of them Swiss and German Lutherans, who had been fighting for Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and they were suddenly let go and they decided to attack Rome. Rosso didn't go straight to Florence. He went to Arezzo and found it so pleasant that he didn't move on because the mercenary soldiers, after they'd attacked Rome, they were there for six months. They burned things, they raped women, they pillaged, they destroyed libraries, they wrote graffiti all over, they tortured people, they held them for ransom. And then they moved northward and they stopped near Arezzo, not in the city, but they destroyed one of the farmhouses that the Vasari family owned, and then they were moving towards Florence. And so Rosso, rather than go back to Florence, stopped in Arezzo. You can see from the self-portrait why he was called Rosso Red, because his, head, his hair was red. And he's wearing an elaborate brocade outfit to show that he's a successful artist. He was also really a wild and crazy artist. And early in his career, having this kind of influence for Vasari meant that Vasari himself became a wild and crazy artist in ways that he would not have been without this formative experience. Though he made enough money to buy a little house on the outskirts of Arezzo that is now a museum called Casa Vasari, and here's the garden. So it's very modest, but it's really a lovely house and it's beautifully kept. And then he 
earned money by going up and down the Italian peninsula. So he went to Florence, he went up to Bologna, he went down to Arezzo again. So he was going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, all the work that he was doing in Florence gave him real problems with sleep. He was having health problems. And then furthermore, his two patrons, his former classmates, Cardinal Ippolito, who'd been made cardinal and then sent off, as I said, to Turkey, was assassinated on the way back in 1535. And then Alessandro finally became Duke of Florence, but he was assassinated by one of his cousins because the cousin thought he'd make a better Duke than Alessandro. The assassination of Alessandro was really sordid because Lorenzino, his cousin, who thought that he'd be a better Duke than Alessandro, knew that Alessandro liked this married woman. And so he said, I've got that woman in my bedroom, come next door. And instead of finding a woman, he found an assassin. As it turned out, there was a scuffle that ensued and Alessandro defended himself well enough that he almost bit off the thumb of his would-be assassin. And Lorenzino, rather than becoming Duke, was exiled. And the pressure of all of this and not really knowing what was going to happen drove Vasari to a nervous breakdown. And he, spelt, he spent the nervous breakdown in this amazing place called Camaldoli. So this is a monastic retreat, and you can see that all of the monks have these little houses. And up here, he spent several months, he was painting for the church at Camaldoli. And you can see that Camaldoli is also surrounded by forests. And while he was there, he met another person who was in retreat, the banker Bindo Altoviti, who posed about a year after Vasari was born, around 1512 for Raphael, in a gorgeous portrait that was probably executed by Giulio Romano. And at that point, Bindo is about 20, looking over his shoulder, he's absolutely handsome. What you can see here is that the handsome young man turned into the shrewd old man. He was totally anti-Medici, and he saw this moment after the assassination of Duke Alessandro as a possibility for bringing back the Florentine Republic and getting rid of the Medici once and for all. And so when you look at this portrait, you see a face of an extremely intelligent man. He and Vasari had something important in common. Both of them were called upon at the age of 16 to take over their family fortunes. And so they forged a friendship that was not simply patron and artist. It was much deeper than that. Unfortunately for Bindo Altoviti, the Medici, who was finally fished out a distant relative, was brought in to take over Florence. He was 19. Cosimo's grandfather was Lorenzo the Magnificent, and that qualified him to become Duke of Tuscany. Everybody thought he'd probably be a failure. He was better as a soldier than anything else, but it turned out he was incredibly shrewd. And for Vasari's great lifelong advantage, he turned out to have a brilliant idea of what culture could do for furthering political aims. And so he became one of the great patrons of the 16th century and helped to forge a distinctive Florentine style in painting architecture. It's what's sometimes called mannerism. And you can see him here in a portrait by one of the painters he favored, Angelo Bronzino. It's, he knew quality when he saw it, but he also understood that Vasari was reliable as almost nobody else. And so he immediately, hired Vasari to start painting the apartments in Palazzo Medici, or not Palazzo Medici, sorry, in 
I'm having somebody desperately trying to phone me as I'm trying to give this talk. This is the problem with Zoom. Eventually, Vasari decided he needed to see Rome. And so he went down to Rome in 1531, where he met his friend Francesco Salviati and had a wonderful time sketching the ruins. He then went back to Florence and he was really going back and forth almost as a commuter between Florence and Rome. And finally, really thought that Rome might be the most important place for him. For him. It was not only Salviati, it was also Michelangelo, who was down in Rome working with Pope Paul III Farnese. And so this is the very end of Michelangelo's life when he's doing his massive architectural projects, including completing St. Peter's. And here's Pope Paul III with his two grandsons who were diplomatically called his nephews. And here's a portrait Titian did of all three of them in which it's perfectly clear that grandfather can't stand Ottavio Farnese, his obsequious grandson who's bowing elaborately. At that point, everybody thought that Ottavio was really good for nothing, and they didn't think too much of Cardinal Alessandro, who was the chief administrator or cardinal nephew for this pope. But Alessandro, like Pope Paul himself, was very interested in art and the power of art. And one of the people that Alessandro attracted to himself was the historian and scholar Paolo Giovio, who was himself a friend of Vasari, who decided to move down to Rome. This is Palazzo Farnese, where Alessandro held forth as cardinal. And he had an office right here in the center. This is now the French ambassador's residence. It's also the French School of Classical Studies in Rome. And it's now surrounded, unfortunately, by barriers. And so this is great to see at least the way Palazzo Farnese looks when it's not being today's contemporary Rome with all its barriers and the streets falling apart. So somewhere in here, in one of the elaborately decorated halls, Alessandro Farnese used to have dinner. And in those days, you didn't simply have dinner with people you thought were inferior to you. They watched you eat. And this was thought to be terribly exciting. And so Vasari writes, in those days, this is around 1545, I often went after the day's work to watch the most illustrious Cardinal Farnese eat dinner. There were always people around to entertain him with wonderful refined conversation. One evening, passing from one topic to another as one does in conversation, Monsignor Jovio said that he'd always cherished and still did a great desire to write a treatise that discussed men who were famous in the art of disegno from the time of Cimabue up to our own. When Jovio had finished this discourse, the Cardinal said, turning to me, what do you say, Giorgio? Wouldn't that be a wonderful project? Wonderful, I replied, most illustrious Monsignor. If Jovio will accept help from someone in the field who can sort things out and describe them as they really are. So, added the Cardinal, you can give him a summary and an orderly account of all those artists and their works in order of time. And that way you could also give him the benefit of your expertise. And so I sat down to search through my own memories and my own writings about art and artists. I put together everything that seemed relevant to the project and took it to Jovio who after he had lavished praise on my efforts said to me, my Giorgio, I want you to take over the task of setting down the whole text in the way that you have done so well here, because I don't have the heart for it. I don't know the artistic styles and I don't know all the details that you will know. If I were to do the writing, it would turn out to be a little treatise like Pliny's, which is really boring. Do what I say, Vasari, because I can tell it will turn out beautifully. 
it may be a slightly exaggerated story, but in fact, the Cardinal was right. It did turn out beautifully. In the meantime, Giorgio made a, had made a trip back to Arezzo after he'd come from Camaldoli, so say around 1538. And he started a flaming affair with a wealthy girl in Arezzo, Maddalena Bacci. This is the Bacci Palazzo, and that little piece here says Bacci Corner, Canto dei Bacci. And so this is the Bacci's corner of Arezzo. Maddalena was much too high class to marry a struggling artist as Vasari was. And so instead, she was married off to a suitable military captain for the Florentine army and Maddalena, who models here to the, the Blessed Virgin. She had two children with Giorgio Vasari and I suspect that that may be little Mark Antonio right there posing as the baby Jesus. And so what the Bacci family did is marry off Maddalena and then betroth the 39-year-old Giorgio Vasari to 11-year-old Niccolò Zabacci, who was the little sister of Maddalena, whom he had impregnated. And so the idea was that Niccolò eventually could take care of these illegitimate children rather than put them embarrassingly with their mother. And this is indeed what happened. Vasari was not going to immediately consummate his marriage with an 11-year-old. The little Bacci girl, Nicoloza, stayed with her family for another two years. And then when she was 13, he settled her in the house that we've already seen with his two children by her elder sister who had died in the meantime. And eventually they had a successful marriage in the sense that Giorgio Vasari always really felt that he was at home when he was in Arezzo. And Niccolò Zabacci almost always stayed at home in Arezzo and took care of that household, which was in many ways his source of solace. He called her Cosina, which means little thing, but I think it's from Niccolò Zina. And so it's not quite as object, object or woman as object as it might sound. And he was obviously very fond of her and ultimately painted her into a number of paintings. So he was married by the time the lives came out, but only just. So he started working on them in 1545 in Rome. When he's putting his finishing touches on the manuscript, that's when he went back to Arezzo around 1547, had the flaming affair with Maddalena, got engaged to Nicolosa, and the minute he got engaged, went to Florence in 1550 and published his book there with a preface to Duke Cosimo. When you write a preface in the 16th century to somebody, you want them to give you money, and Duke Cosimo did and we had the first edition of The Lives. The book, but Vasari being the absolute compulsive worker that he was, the minute he published the book, he started revising it. And then in 1568, so 18 years after the first edition, he had a revised, improved edition, which came out again with a Florentine publisher, again with an introduction, the Grand Duke Cosimo, and clearly with a lot of help from his scholarly friend, Vincenzo Borghini, whom you see here. So the Vasari, as a painter, as an architect, and as a writer, always availed himself of assistance. He had a lot of apprentices, he had a lot of assistant painters, and the lives, were composed in part by people where he sent letters all over Italy saying, what do you know about Titian? What do you know about Giorgione? 
what do you know about Antonello da Messina, took all of these reports and then compiled them, and Borghini helped him to refine his prose. Although, as we can see from that original comment by Jovio, Vasari had a great way of writing himself. He really knows how to tell a story. And that's why we still read the book today, because there are all those great stories where Buonamico Bufalmaco wants to scare his master. And so he fixes candles to the backs of cockroaches and drives them under the door of his master, scares the master to death because he thinks that the candle bearing cockroaches are devils. There are all the stories in Piero di Cosimo lives only on eggs. At the same time, Vasari was also collecting drawings by people, everybody. Up to that point, people just thought that disegno in the sense of drawing on paper, those were preparatory drawings. They were scrap paper after you'd used them. And what Giorgio Vasari started doing is grabbing these things, pasting them into books and making collections. Unfortunately, the books now have been completely dispersed. Collectors tore out these pages. They're all over the world and people are really happy when they find them. But what he was doing is elevating the position of drawing as an art, saying that this kind of disegno is as important as every other kind of disegno, that this is where ideas first meet physical manifestation. And so in a way, these preparatory drawings are closer to the origin of creation in people's heads. With Borghini and another group of artists and with the sponsorship of Michelangelo who died shortly after, in 1563, Duke Cosimo, who by this time had managed to make himself Grand Duke Cosimo, he was the highest ranking Duke in all of Italy, and so Grand Duke Cosimo sponsored the Accademia del Disegno. There was a state-run art school that's a Disegno Academy. This could be deadly dull. It could be the kind of thing where you teach a neoclassicism where everything great has already been invented by Michelangelo and all we can do is imitate. But in fact, the Academia del Disegno, I think, was much more creative because of the fact that this founder, Giorgio Vasari, was so creative himself that he really thought Disegno was the beginning of something wonderful, creation or invention. One of his tall stories has stayed with us forever. And he loved to tell gossip about Raphael because Raphael wasn't Tuscan. Raphael came from Urbino, though he's from another part of Italy, and he couldn't possibly be the greatest painter because he wasn't Tuscan. It just, he wasn't probably an Etruscan. He was from some tribe over on the east coast of Italy. And so there are stories that slightly diminish him including the, but they're very entertaining. So he says, Raphael just loved women. He had a really strong libido. And he finally conceived an incredible passion for a baker's daughter in Trastevere, where he was working for the banker Agostino Chigi, decorating Agostino's house. And finally, he just spending all of his time at the baker's daughter's house and not doing his painting. So Agostino Chigi locked him in Kiji's house with the baker's daughter and they could do whatever they wanted, but get the work done. That's also Vasari, the compulsive getter of work done on time, criticizing Raphael, who became famous later in his life for not finishing everything. 19th century painters just loved fantasizing about Raphael and the baker's daughter. So here you've got the baker's daughter and Raphael, and he's painting a painting that we now know is by Sebastiano del Piombo and not by Raphael at all. 
And here's Anglin where you've got Agostino Chigi's villa. And here they are locked in embrace and locked inside. And he's looking at a painting. And even today, this painting that's in the gallery of, it's called Arte Antica, which doesn't mean ancient art in Italy. What it means is old art, but classic art. And the legend since the 19th century has been that this is a painting of the baker's daughter. As you can see, it's signed. There's an armband that says Rafael Urbinas. And she's not wearing a whole lot. I actually personally think this is one of the many draw or the many paintings that Raphael's workshop made of professional courtesans, which Vasari tells us he did. Because they're just certain, I think it was probably painted by John Francesco Penny, Raphael's assistant, just because of the way the style is. The director of the Barberini Palace, which houses this gallery, would probably not be so happy for me saying that. And then look at that hand. I don't think Raphael could have painted that hand to save his life. It's so awkward. But because of Vasari's story about the baker's daughter, this is still thought to be the baker's daughter whom Raphael loved and who in the 19th century, everybody decided became a nun about a block from my present home in Trastevere because a young woman four days after Raphael's death in 1520 came wanting to be a nun and her name was Margarita. And there's a pearl here on this young woman's turban and the world, word for pearl is Margarita. So this is the proof that this has to be the baker's daughter that Vasari talks about who becomes a nun. It's a great story like so much in Vasari, but I don't think we should take that like so many of his other stories as gospel truth. What is really significant, and I think one of his lasting legacies and one that I'm very grateful for this talk making me think about is the way that his theory of art, which is usually subordinated to what he's doing with the biographies, which are so entertaining, but he has a really systematic view of what Disegno should be. This is a painting that he used to inspire himself at home. This is St. Luke painting the Virgin, and the Virgin, as you can see, is made an epiphany. This is the real Virgin Mary and baby Jesus coming down from heaven to pose for St. Luke. This is his allegorical beast, the ox. And he's so excited that he's painting. So you see, he's got a paintbrush and then he's got this rod that allows him to steady his hand when he's working on a large painting. But here you've really got the idea that Disegno comes from a concept in the mind, it's divine. When an idea is born in our heads, in Vasari's view, as in Plato's before him, there's something godlike. It's a spark of heaven that suddenly is set off in our own heads and we think of something new, combined of all the things that we know and refined through our skill. And then we put that down in some kind of a material medium, whether it be drawing or writing or sculpture or architecture. And the important thing here is that disegno, this Italian word, can mean all of these things. At one point, Vasari says that he's reading and drawing inspiration from writings by Lorenzo Ghiberti about art and about and papers from Raphael. And Raphael never printed anything on art, but he did an intense study of Vitruvius, the ancient architectural writer. And here's part of the manuscripts that were in his possession that Vasari clearly saw. And what fascinates me about this is it means that Vasari's also reading Vitruvius and what he's doing 
with the lives is very similar to what Vitruvius was doing with his 10 books on architecture in the time of Augustus. Both of them are writing a kind of literature that's never existed. And through this new kind of literature, they're trying to show that artists should be a higher social class than craftspeople, that artists are thinkers, artists are philosophers, artists should have the same kind of social status as writers because what artists do is exactly like writing. The act of composition is exactly the same, it's simply manifested differently. And I got to wondering why is it that Vasari doesn't talk more about Vitruvius? And I think the reason is because in Rome, in the 1540s, when he starts writing lives, there's a group called the Vitruvian Academy who are exactly what learned academies have a reputation for being hidebound, conservative, incredibly boring. And I think that Vasari wants to line himself up with the creative artists and not have anything to do with this kind of plodding pedantic exercise. The Vitruvian Academy was going to do a 27 volume commentary on the 10 books of Vitruvius. And 10 books don't mean books in our sense, they mean chapters, they're papyrus scrolls. So the, the treatise of Vitruvius isn't very long. The writing a 27 volume commentary is the kind of thing that would probably kill you. And so I think this is my tentative answer for why he doesn't talk more about the similarities between his theory of design, Vitruvius's theory of design, and their joint effort to write new kinds of literature and to foster creativity is I think both Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture and Vasari's lives are really telling you how to produce the best kind of creative art while still being creative. What are the boundaries of creativity and license? How do you keep your invention fresh? I think that's the achievement that both of them had. For Vasari, there's no question who's the best artist who lived, ever lived in the highest expression of human spirit. It was Michelangelo. And it's hard to argue with David. He's still pretty wonderful. One of the things that I like is that this was sculpted in 1501, finished in 1504, and it's telling you how wonderful it feels not to have the Medici ruling Florence. Um, Florentines were extremely ambivalent about the Medici. And one of the things that we've also inherited, not from Vasari himself, but from his sponsor, Grand Duke Cosimo, is this idea of the glorious history of Florence. All of that was put together by the brilliance of Cosimo the first who makes a myth of Florence that was so compelling that we still believe it with every fiber of our being. It's hard to go to Florence and not think it's glorious because it is glorious, but we've been programmed to think of it as glorious and the great cradle of invention at the expense often of Rome. And so what Vasari tries to do is systematically show that artists from Cimabue at the very end of the 13th century starting to bring creativity in Tuscany, especially out of medieval confusion into Renaissance order. And his idea of disegno is extremely broad. So he talks about the woman sculptor Properzia dei Rossi who hews marble, but she can also put a hundred heads in a cherry pit. And so this is a Properzia dei Rossi cherry pit from the Medici collection that you can still see here, or she'll do, here's a sculpted walnut shell with a miniature sculpture inside. 
And so he leaps open things like embroidery, saddle painting, cherry pit carving. He's not totally limited in his idea of what an art can be. He talks mostly about painters, sculptors, and architects, but he also gives little hints that there are all kinds of diseño that are important. And here's another of his paintings from his own house. This is a conflation of two different ancient stories. One is the great painter Apelles painting Diana, which we have a record of him painting because Pliny the Elder says that he painted Diana. But this is also conflating another story that has a lot again to do with invention on the basis of diseño, because Zeuxis, the great Greek painter, was supposed to paint Helen of Troy. And so what he did is he found five live models, compared them all, and synthesized a perfect Helen of Troy from all five, so that no earthly person is flawless, but you can make a flawless idea on the basis of studying the best of what's available in nature, and from that, a diseño can be born in your mind. Michelangelo obviously thought the same thing. Here's the creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and here's God's diseño, all in his cloak. These are all the people that are going to happen after he's given life to Adam, and then he'll make Eve, and then after that, there will be human beings. But what Michelangelo's showing you is that even inside God's cloak, the whole history of humanity is there, along with the history of the world, the universe. All of these things are a diseño in God's head before the diseño of nature is laid out for us. And then the diseño of history puts that design in motion. Though if you look at Vasari, he's totally unlike these ideal quattrocento perfect cityscapes because he's a friend and he did the Suffizi, which is anything but static. So here you've got a beautiful place. You've got a round building in the middle. It says you're in the right place. You don't have to go anywhere. Here you are at Vasari's Uffizi, where the whole thing is that you move. The arch at the end is drawing you to experience this building by moving through it. It's dynamic. And if you look at the architectural articulation, everything's really three dimensional. It's sculpture as well as architecture, whereas everything here is, by comparison, a little bit flat. In the same way, Leonardo's perfectly proportioned Vitruvian man modeled on himself is totally unlike this drawing of Michelangelo that he gave as a gift. So he gave a diseño, a paper drawing to Francesco Salviati, Vasari's friend. And from this diseño on paper, Francesco made a diseño in his mind of a painting which we see today in the church of Santa Maria del Anima, but it's not an ideal figure, it's very exaggerated. Whereas this is really what you see if you're Leonardo and you look in the mirror and this Christ is not a normal body, not normally proportioned, he's in another world. And that's characteristic of the kind of art that comes out of Florence under Cosimo de' Medici. And so in the end, I think that Vasari would agree very much with this t-shirt. One of my friends from the Museum of Design in Atlanta, Georgia gave me, where it says design equals change. And I think that's it. Vasari thinks diseño equals invenzione. It doesn't make you create something static. It's always searching for something new. If you look at his career, he did pretty well. 
So if we just run through it, he did this immense Salone dei Cinquecento in Florence for the Council of 500. He painted the cupola of Brunelleschi's dome that he writes so amusingly about and how Brunelleschi got the commission by smashing an egg on a table and everybody said, hey, we could all do it. Then Brunelleschi said, but you didn't. I did. This is the last project he did. He didn't live to see its completion. He did the Uffizi. He was very proud of putting a building of that size on the slippery bank of the River Arno with all of its floods. This building he designed to house the University of Pisa for Grand Duke Cosimo, whom you see right there. And it now houses the descendant of the University of Pisa, the Scuola Normale. So this is still the working administration building and lecture hall for the Scuola Normale. He put in water to Piazza Grande in Arezzo, and he put a portico. So here you've got medieval Arezzo, here's Vasari Arezzo. He modernized it with this portico and brought it up to date and created an aqueduct to feed Piazza Grande and the aqueduct still exists. He painted the Sala Regia, the room that goes from the Sistine Chapel into here, the Pauline, oops. So that's the Sistine Chapel's door. This takes you to the Pope's private chapel, the Pauline Chapel. Each one of these has its own different cardinal in charge. And he painted this hall in the Chancellery of the Vatican. It's actually or the papacy. This is Palazzo della Cancelleria in the middle of Rome. And he did it with his assistants in 100 days. So of course, all of his detractors said yes, and it looks like it. But it shows if he needs to do something quickly, he will do it no matter what. For Bindo Altoviti, whom he met at Camaldoli, he made this loggia and decorated it with his own frescoes. We can't see this because it's been torn down for flood control but the frescoes were saved. And he frescoed this Gothic sacristy in Naples. So from Naples all the way up to Bologna, Vasari has left his trace, but his real reputation goes everywhere that his books do. And so this is his greatest legacy. And as I hope I've tried to argue, I think it's a legacy telling us that Design and art are always alive, always creative. There are ways to make better art and worse art, but the really important thing is that it's forever new. Thank you very much. <laughs>